so welcome to, to our next talk uh, about um, finding vulnerabilities in closed source PHP applications. Our speaker Stefan Essen, I'm very, very glad that uh, he made it to the Congress this year. <laughs> it was not easy to get it <laughs> to talk about this topic, but uh, I hope you enjoy the next one. Uh, just welcome Stefan Essen. Thank you. Um, okay, so welcome to my talk, Vulnerability Discovery in Closed Source PHP Application. And um, for those that don't know who I am, my name is Stefan Esser. I'm from Cologne in Germany, and um, I work for approximately 10 years in information security, and for eight years I'm a PHP core developer. Uh, last year, I did the month of PHP bugs, where I disclosed um, every day of the month at least one security vulnerability in PHP itself. And I'm the author and maintainer of uh, the Zuhu Shim project, which is a security extension to PHP. And last but not least, I'm um, head of research and development of Section 1 GmbH, which is a German web application security company. So what is the talk about? Um, I want to speak about PHP source code encryption, about how to recover bytecode from uh, these encrypted PHP applications, how to visualize the bytecode, how to do vulnerability discovery within the bytecode, and finally I will also uh, tell you that decomp decompilation is possible. First, why do people encrypt their PHP application? Um, the first thing is um, many enterprise companies want to um, protect their inte intellectual property and therefore they don't want to give out source code even to their customers and so they uh, encrypt the PHP application um, in a way that you can't see the source code and uh, you cannot make changes. The next thing is uh, PHP source code encryption uh, software is often used in or used by shareware authors. Uh, shareware usually has some um, license system that needs to be protected so that you can make your key file yourself. And um, then, like I said before, another reason to encrypt your source code is so that your customer cannot change the source code. Quite often when you have a large PHP application, you give it to the customer and they make custom changes and then they call your support hotline and ask you about features you never implemented because uh, they implemented them themselves. So the bugs are also them, uh, their own. And last but not least, some companies uh, encrypt their PHP applications because they want to hide their own intellectual property uh, violations so that no one can see how, how and where they store code. So why do we or why do I care? Uh, the problem is last year a customer for the first time asked me to, uh, to audit uh, an encrypted PHP application. Basically it was one of these shareware applications, he bought it and wasn't so sure about the security and he gave the software to us and um, we had to, to audit it and at, le at least the core libraries of this shareware product were encrypted. So normally you have no chance to get the source code and you cannot do your usual source code audits on it. The next problem with PHP encryption tools is um, there are no public unpacking tools. There are some Russian or Chinese unpackers for some of the cryptos, but first of all they cost money and secondly uh, usually the, the GUI is in Chinese or in Russian and have fun using, using them. Um, yeah. Why do we care? We care because uh, all the stan standard white box auditing mechanisms we, we are using, like a source code audit or like trying to hook some function and fuzz the application, they don't work with these encrypted uh, PHP applications. On the one hand, there is no source code, so we cannot do a source code audit on, on these applications. And on the other hand, when we try to hook some functions like the MySQL query function and try to, to fuzz the application, uh, suddenly our hooks will not be called because uh, the engine internally works different with these scriptors available and so uh, our hooks will never hook and so uh, 
we will not catch the, uh, the fast elements. And last but not least, uh, uh, if we find vulnerabilities in closed source PHP applications, um, first of all, not so many people can find these vulnerabilities, so uh, you maybe have some real zero days. And on the other hand, is even if they, uh, your bugs leak, only the vendor can fix it. So normally when you have a PHP application and it's open source, anyone who gets get to know the vulnerability can just change the, uh, the source code and can fix the vulnerability. But with encrypted PHP applications, only the uh, author or the vendor can uh, change and fix the vulnerability. Um, when I speak about PHP uh, encrypted, um, no, when I speak about encrypted PHP applications, I don't mean dislike encryption, like um, they just uh, create some um, obfuscated PHP code and then they call the base64 decode function to decrypt, uh, to decode some, some string and then they evaluate the string. This is nothing I'm, I'm speaking about because um, this kind of protection can be easily defeated by just changing the PHP source code and hook the evil function and you just output the, uh, the, uh, um, the parameter of the evil function instead of executing it and then you get the original source code back. Maybe you need to step to, through several layers but usually you get the, the original source code and this is not really a protection. Um, what I speak about is uh, something that looks like this. Um, here you can see an example from a SendGuard encrypted file and basically you see, you see a, a PHP header, then some um, marker to, to give IDEs the chance to, to see that this is not a text file by just embedding some um, binary data in the beginning. And then you get, get a lot of um, nonsense PHP that uh, does only print out a banner saying this one is an encrypted file, please download the loader there and there. And in the end, in the last two or three lines, you see binary garbage. And this binary garbage is actually the encrypted PHP source code. And you see there's no chance that you can get the original source code from that and um, you may, maybe you can try. But um, actually this is encrypted by code and uh, there's no source code anymore. So for more secure PHP, uh, encryption, um, this is usually implemented below the user space because everything you do in user space can be hooked from within PHP and you can just see what they are doing. So um, PHP encryptions are usually encrypt, uh, implemented in a loadable extension and you cannot run the PHP application without the loader extension. For example, with the send guard, this is the send optimizer. If your server does a, doesn't have the send optimizer, you cannot run send guard encrypted files. And what send guard actually does is um, it takes the PHP code, compiles it, um, the, the resulting bytecode is encrypted in, with several layers, and um, so the, the source code is completely gone. You cannot recover the original source code from there. Um, I have some pictures. So normally you have uh, the PHP source, source code which is green and this gets passed to the send compile function. The send compile function will first tokenize it, then compile it and the result is some kind of PHP bytecode and this bytecode is then passed to the um, send execute function that executes the bytecode. So what happens when we load the send guard or the send, uh, the send optimizer? The send optimizer will, uh, first of all, it will hook in between uh, the PHP source code and the PHP compiler and will replace the, uh, the compiler with something that's called the Guardian compiler. And the Guardian compiler will first check before it, uh, it compiles the code. It will first check if this is actually a send card encrypted file and if it's encrypted then it will call its own routines otherwise it will just pass the file to the original compiler. Um, with old cryptors this was everything that was done. So um, no, sorry. Um, 
the compiler on the one hand uh, gives the original source code to the um, to the original compiler when it's not encrypted. But when it's encrypted, it just decrypts it and it executes it. And um, with older uh, encryptors, uh, this, this, uh, this execu execution was done by passing the decrypted bytecode directly to the P PHP executor. And so with old cryptos, uh, once you, you uh, had hooked the ex execute function, you had the original bytecode and uh, could work on the bytecode. With newer cryptos, the complete executor is replaced with something different. And uh, so, in this case, send optimizer executes this uh, encrypted PHP and not the, the PHP engine. So, there's some available PHP uh, bytecode encryptors. These are only the three uh, most known. This is uh, first SendGuard from Send. Then there's the INQ PHP encoder from, uh, from INCube and Source Guardian from Source Guardian. And there are a lot of different cryptos, especially the people behind Source Guardian have a lot of white labeled cryptos that are all more or less the same, but they sell them to different uh, users to different prices with different names. So uh, when you see one of those cryptos and you cannot really see uh, who is behind it, then most probably it's one of the Source Guardian ones. They have a lot of uh, strange companies in Eastern Europe uh, and every country has a different crypto and um, yeah but most of them are developed by source guardian people. So PHP source code encryption usually uh, exists on three levels. First we have the simple encryption which means uh, the PHP bytecode is encrypted. Then the second level is some kind of obfuscation. So within the PHP bytecode, they um, obfuscate function and variable names. The bytecode itself is not obfuscated by the current cryptos, only the names. And last but not least, the newer cryptos have some protection. So uh, like I already said, uh, anti-hooking functionality so that you cannot simply fuss the application. So far, I already spoke about PHP bytecode, but what actually is PHP bytecode? When PHP developers talk about PHP bytecode, they usually mean um, the opcode arrays. And opcode arrays are some internal structure within the send engine, and they are the smallest compilation execution unit that exists. And within this structure, there, there's the function name this uh, opcode op array belongs to, there's the file name, and there are the line numbers this this was compiled from there are some type uh, information like which kind of function, which kind of method this is, is it a private, pr protected, or public one. And there are some other flags like if this is an internal function or a user space function. And of course, there are also um, information and uh, about the function parameters. So within the opcode array, there's a table of allowed function parameters with the default values, with their type hints, if there are any, and um, of course there's also the number of minimal needed parameters and the maximum number of parameters stored within the opcode array. And last but not least is there's of course the, uh, the bytecode, which is uh, stored in kind of op lines, uh, which are the opcode lines, and I would come to that now. Um, for every op line, um, every opline in the PHP bytecode stores exactly one uh, comment. You have there the opcode, like in many other, um, if you know assembly language, you know that you have usually um, an opcode and some parameters, and in PHP bytecode it's the same. You have the opcode, there are about 150 op different opcodes in PHP. They are all very high level. And then you have an optional result parameter, an operand, a result operand, and you have um, one, two, or three um, optional operands. Um, here on the slide, you only see operand one and operand two, because in the beginning, there were only two operands, uh, one and two, uh, but some of the opcodes require more operands, and then they are stored in the extension uh, value. And there are very few, like three or four opcodes, that still need more operands, and then they uh, take two opcode lines in, um, in the opcode array, and, but they are only, like you need it for, for each and some array dimensions. But normally you only have one opcode line per opcode. 
And one very nice thing that is often not removed by cryptos, by the ED cryptos, is there's also, uh, for every opcode, there is a field that stores um, the exact PHP source code line number this uh, opcode was compiled from. Sometimes it doesn't work. If you have a an, uh, an statement that spans uh, across several lines, then it doesn't work. Then you have only the last line in, in this, um, in this uh, number. But uh, usually it works. So you, uh, you know this opcode is from line 5 in the PHP file, so then you can look in the source if you have the source code. So something to the, um, about the operands. In PHP, which is very important, there are five different operand types. First, first there is the const op uh, operand type, which is for constant values, like never changing things in, in the source code, like a defined string, a defined number, or something else, or a defined array. So um, these cannot change. So if you see them somewhere in the bytecode, you know that this cannot be user input because it's always a constant. The next thing is there are so-called temporary variables. Uh, these are for storing intermediate results of uh, multiplications, additions, concatenations, and all the uh, intermediate variables used by the engine. Then you have a, a operand type which is called var. These are the variables. So these uh, variables are um, like references to real PHP variables. So when you see this kind of operand used, it's uh, usually uh, the reference to a real PHP variable. With PHP 5.1, there was a new type introduced, which is uh, the um, CV, the compiled variable type. And this is basically the same like um, the var type, with a difference that um, Simple local variables in a, in a scope, um, they usually don't need to be looked up every time uh, you access them. And uh, earlier PHP versions, when you accessed, for example, the very long variable name uh, variable, then um, every time you access them, every time you add, um, you add something to it, you, you, every time you use it, PHP needs to look up this very long name in the table and uh, uh, to um, to speed this up, um, there was introduced a new t uh, type of um, variable, which is the compiled variable. So now PHP knows this is like the variable with index 5. And so now when uh, in the opcode there's only stored I'm a compiled variable with index 5, so PHP doesn't need to, to look up the very long name. It just needs to look up index 5 in its own table, and then it knows where the, uh, where, where the variable is. This uh, uh, result in a very huge speed up between P PHP 5.0 and 5.1. And last but not least, sometimes um, operands are just unused, uh, which doesn't mean they are really unused. They just mean they are not, not one of the four I just mentioned. They are just not de defined by the four previous ones. So this is actually everything you need to know about by PHP bytecode. And um, after the bytecode is compiled, it will get passed to the executor. And the executor is very different in different PHP versions. In PHP 4, it was like one very large function with lots of uh, cases of a switch statement. And so um, it was one very large function that contained all the engine in it. And then with PHP 5, it was introduced that every opcode got an own handler function. So the, uh, the executor just loops through the oplines and calls the, uh, the, uh, the handler. With PHP 5.1, um, with the introduction of the CV uh, variables, um, another speed up was introduced. So now we have um, not one, but 25 opcode handlers per opcode. So that PHP uh, knows there are two operands, and now it knows the first one is a CV, and the second one is li like unused. So then it can calculate which of the 25 one it needs to, uh, to call. And there's a speed up because now every opcode handler doesn't need to look up, is this a CV, then I need to access the variable this way. Uh, if it's a var, I need to access this variable this way. So now it, uh, it actually, can access it directly in the, in the correct way, and um, this results in another speed up. 
which is very helpful for unpacking PHP, but you will see this later. So I already said for every combination of operands, there are five different, um, no, for every combination of the five operands, there's uh, um, one opcode handler. So let's get back to the encryption. When I started uh, working on the PHP bytecode encryptors, um, I was like, I'm lazy, I don't want to do it in individually for every crypto. I worked on uh, runtime encryptions uh, during the days of uh, DOS and early Windows cryptors, and so I knew that every time to, you crack a crypto, you just start a cat and mouse game, the render will change uh, a few bits and suddenly your unpacker doesn't work anymore and you have work again. So it's a very time consuming thing and I want to spend my time on other things. So um, I didn't want to do reverse engineering on every new version of SendGuard or IronCube and so I searched for a generic way to uh, remove the bytecode encryptors. And therefore I searched weaknesses within the current bytecode encryptors. Uh, like I already said, in the older cryptos, um, you had it, uh, that you had the, uh, the hook of the compile function and uh, the, this hook just decrypted all the bytecode and then gave it to the original execute function and uh, executed the bytecode by PHP. The problem with that is, at this point, of course, the bytecode is completely decrypted. So you don't need to do anything anymore. You just hook the send execute function and you get the, the, uh, the decrypted bytecode for free. So you can do anything you want on this bytecode after that. And the other thing is the older cryptos, because they do not replace the executor, they cannot uh, use uh, obfuscation. Because uh, if they want to do obfuscation, they, um, they need to hook within the engine so that some of their, their tricks will still work. And right now, this is, you know, they, they don't do this. Well, actually, it would be possible, but they don't do it. They just decrypt everything and uh, are ready. The modern cryptos, on the other hand, are completely different. The modern cryptos, they first um, try to obfuscate everything, and then they replace the executor. The good thing is, uh, when you have an applica a PHP application, you often have a large part which is the core and the, the uh, vendor doesn't want you to, uh, to look into it and to change it. And then you have a lot of modules on the outside. The problem is when you have modules on the outside, they are source code. And it's impossible to have obfuscated core with uh, plain text uh, modules on the outside because the modules on the outside need to, be, need to communicate with the core. And so if you obfuscate the core, uh, the modules cannot access the core anymore. And therefore, most of the PHP applications, they are not encrypted with, with obfuscation uh, activated. So usually most of these applications are not obfuscated at all. And therefore, removing the bytecode uh, byte encryption is very easy. And even if you, um, if you cannot de-obfuscate, because uh, it's obfuscated. The thing is, for security analysis, you don't want the original source code. You don't need all the fancy variable names. They have, might help you, but you don't need them to do uh, security analysis. So most of the cases, you don't care. The other thing is, which is, this is the biggest weakness of the current uh, encryptors is, um, they are also very lazy people, so they just steal PHP uh, source code well, they use it, it's not, it's not stolen because it's allowed by the license, but they just take the original executor, just copy it, they just change a few things and they just need to uh, use the original executor, which means it works exactly the same like the internal PHP uh, executor, which also means uh, they have the same uh, very large opcode table in memory with 25 handlers per opcode, and we will use that for the generic decryption. The idea I came up with to, to create a generic unpacker was very simple. The idea was, um, I know the, encrypt, uh, the encryptor tool, the optimizer for example, or the IronCube loader is loaded in memory, so somewhere in memory there must be the opcode table. 
uh, the handler table. And so uh, the first thing I do in, in the decryptor is to search this uh, handler table in memory. Uh, how I do this, I will tell later. And then I replace all the opcodes in there, which is 25 times 150. I replace them all with so-called recording handlers. And then I just execute the PHP file as normally, but uh, it's nothing executed, it's just recorded. And after that, I repair the, uh, the operay and dump the operay everywhere I need and, or store them for fur further analysis or just print out the disassembly, whatever I want to do. So how do I find the opcode table? Um, it's very simple. First, I start at the address of the replacement send execute form uh, function because I know this is the function, this is the address within the code segment of the, um, of the uh, optimizer or the um, INCube loader. I also know that um, the data segment is loaded directly after the, um, the code segment with these uh, dynamic libraries. And so I can just start scanning from, from the code uh, pointer uh, downward in the memory and, um, or upward, depending on your, how you like it. Um, and then I search for, for this uh, structure in memory. And actually finding the structure in memory is very simple because I, I know it's uh, aligned in memory. That means uh, the bytes before will always be null. So I search for a single null pointer and then for something else. And this something else is I know that there are 25 opcode handlers per opcode. So the first opcode is knob opcode. And um, there are no different types to implement a knob opcode. So every, every one of these 25 opcode handlers is the same. So I just search for a null pointer followed by 25 the same pointer in the code segment and then followed by something different which is not the same pointer. And um, by using this simple heuristic, I never found a false positive, so I always found the, the real opcode handler in memory, and from that I can work further. So the next problem is to detect the end of the opcode table. Um, I already told you I'm lazy, so um, I don't detect that. I just know that uh, TentGuard just replaces 150 or 51 opcodes. So for SendGuard, it's always 151. And for IronCube, it's like 255. And SourceGuardian, uh, they, they don't need this. Um, so uh, for now, I only have these two very hard cryptos like SendGuard and uh, IronCube encoder. And so I only need two hard-coded values. And maybe when there are new cryptos that use this functionality, I will try and write an automatic detection. The next thing is I just uh, back up the original table into some of my own memory and then I replace it with, uh, with recording handlers. And these recording handlers just um, record the decrypted operands. When the, the moment the, uh, the opcode handler is called, um, it gets called with the decrypted operands by the cryptos. So I just record what I see. I see, oh, I was a recording handler for opcode 5 and this is operand 1, this is operand 2 and these are the other operands or special flags. And then I just continue with the next opcode op line. And I repeat this um, through all operates, through all methods, to all functions. And um, I trigger the execution of every bit of PHP code I see in the encrypted file. And I just store the decrypted uh, operates in some memory place, or later I dump it to the disk. And after I'm ready with that, I just restore the backup of the opcode handlers to, um, from my own memory to the, uh, to the table. And when I'm lucky, uh, I survived this whole process without a segmentation fault. Sometimes uh, this results in a uh, segmentation fault. I still don't know why. Um, but usually it works when you have like 4,000 4, encrypted files, maybe 10 are, are crashing the interpreter. And so uh, until now, I didn't need to, um, to really find out why it sometimes crashes. Um, after I have the decrypted opcode array, there's a problem. Because some of these uh, encryptors, they also optimize the bytecode. And by when they optimize the bytecode, they sometimes insert their own, their own defined opcode handlers. 
uh, no, they introduce new own opcodes. Especially SendGuardian uh, introduces some um, function caching that works similar to the compiled variables. It's, uh, I call it compiled functions. I don't know how it's called internally by send, but it's actually the same like the compiled variables for function names. So they replace all the cal call function opcodes with call function by index, and so they just have a, a number, and then they look up the function uh, pointer in some internal array. The problem is when you um, don't know about these opcodes, you can't do anything with the opcode array because all functions are gone. You only see some unknown opcode and you can't do anything with it. So um, you need a little bit of reverse engineering to understand the, uh, the new introduced opcodes. Right now there are three or four. Uh, three of them are to totally useless. They are just... Uh, they are never used. They are just some corner cases optimi optimizations that are never used. The, very, the most important one is the, the call function by index one. And uh, you need maybe half an hour to reverse engineer what this thing is actually doing. And uh, after that you know it and you can implement it in your, in your crypto. You can even repair the, uh, the bytecode array by just replacing this with the original call function opcode and just switching the, the operand, which is a number, to uh, a string. So it's directly a function name. And so you have uh, restored an original PHP uh, bytecode array. Yeah, like, like I already said, a generic unpacker can either choose to ignore these unknown uh, opcodes or, uh, and remove them or uh, try to replace it. The problem is when you remove it, you maybe lose uh, the logic of the, uh, logic of the program because you lose all function calls. Uh, future cryptos might change other bytecodes and so um, you will even lose more. So normally you need to, uh, to reverse engineer this one or these two uh, opcodes and um, handle them in your encryptor, uh, decryptor. But for now it's very simple because um, IonCube and uh, the people behind SendGuard, they, uh, they actually they know that you can uh, bypass their products and they don't care because they just tell them, their customers to use obfuscation and then the customers say, I cannot use obfuscation and say, then they say, it's your own problem if you don't use uh, obfuscation. And uh, so um, they just uh, don't invest much time in it. So at this point, you have uh, the decrypted bytecode and the repaired bytecode somewhere either in the memory or on the disk. And now you have the problem, yeah, this is some bytecode, but now how do I find vulnerabilities in it? And I will try to explain four different things you can do with the bytecodes. Uh, first of all, you need some kind of user space access to the, to the bytecode so that your scripts can access the bytecode and read it, parse it, and whatever you want to do with it. And then uh, I will show you how to um, visualize and navigate within the bytecode. Um, I will show some slide about bytecode decompilation and uh, some uh, automatic analysis you can do on the bytecode. First of all, like I said, uh, you need some way to access the bytecode from within PHP. Um, a PHP application cannot access the bytecode directly. Um, this is different maybe in other languages, but in PHP uh, there's no way to get to the bytecode from within PHP without using some internal memory corruption or some overflow. Um, within the PHP world, there are two uh, extensions to PHP that give you access to the bytecode. The first one is uh, the Vulkan Logic, Logic Disassembler by Derek Rithans. And it basically is um, yeah, a disassembler of, of normal bytecode. And if you patch it a bit, uh, you can even get the original bytecode from SourceGuardian because SourceGuardian has no um, execution hooks. So it just hooks the execute function and dumps the, uh, the opcodes at the execution function and so you have the decrypted uh, bytecode and can see it and disassemble it. Uh, the problem is um, the, uh, the disassembly doesn't help you because it's a text and you would need to, to, um, to pass the text and then uh, 
restore some internal uh, structure for yourself so that, can, that you can work on it. So um, Sarah Goleman wrote some, some different PHP ex extension which is called Passkit. In Passkit there's nothing else but uh, provide a function that call, is called Passkit compile file and you just call it and it will give you back a PHP array uh, that contains all the um, internal information I just showed you on the previous slide. It just show, it gives you um, a PHP array which is an exact copy of the bytecode arrays in memory. So you can work on it. The problem with Passkit is that, um, yeah, let's say in 50% of the cases it will sec fault. Um, in the other 50% of the cases you will end up with uh, some of the bytes uh, with the opcodes correctly decoded and some of the opcodes are simply wrong decoded because Sarah doesn't work on it anymore and a lot of the information is just cut, uh, copy and pasted and so a lot of opcodes in, in Passkit doesn't work. Uh, but you, you can use it to get a rough idea of, of, what, of what I'm speaking about. Because of uh, um, the problems with Passkit, I developed my own extension with this, which is called ByteDisk or sometimes ByteKit. Um, it's similar to Passkit. Actually, it gives you all the features of Passkit, but it gives you more things. First of all, of course, it gives you the raw opcode um, access like Passkit does, but then it gives you also uh, already the disassembled opcodes. So you don't need to write a disassembler, you just use ByteDisk byte or ByteKit and um, you get the disassembled opcodes for free. And then of course you get a function class list, but this you can also restore from, from the other uh, arrays. And last but not least, this is the most important thing, it will give you code flow information. You will get for every opcode um, an array that tells you uh, which opcode lines will be executed afterwards, which will be executed before. And um, so if you want to buy, uh, create a code flow graph, you can do this with this information very easily. Um, if you're now Googling for ByteDisk or ByteKit, you will not find it because it's not public yet. I will uh, release it within January when I cleaned up the code. Uh, right now it's not, not public. So what can you do with uh, ByteKit or ByteDisk? The first thing I tried was, um, uh, the thing is I hate simple disassemblies and reading PHP code in disassemblies is very uh, tiring. And I also wanted to, to create nice core graphs and nice flow graphs. And um, so I was searching for a way to graphically uh, represent the PHP disassembly. And uh, most of you maybe know Binavi. And uh, my first idea was to just write a PHP to SQL script that uh, exports the PHP bytecode to um, Binavi. Um, for those that don't know Binavi, Binavi is uh, a very nice tool to do binary audits and it will look like this. And this is actually uh, a PHP function within Binavi. Um, this one is taken from, no, this one is not taken from FluxBB. This one is a demo, demo function and uh, if you can read the bytecode you will see that there is a include vulnerability in line I can't read it, but um, um, if you see the, the second box from, from the um, from, from bottom, there's an include of a, of a variable, and this one is actually a function parameter, so if you call the function with untrusted user input, it will include an arbitrary PHP file, and you can execute any code you want. I will come to this later. Um, Another thing you can do in Binavi is to look at the, uh, the call graph and um, in the large window you see a very small part of the call graph of, uh, of this FluxBB which is a, a port of, um, no, a fork of PanBB and in the upper left, yeah, upper left corner you see the complete uh, call graph which is a little bit uh, complicated this is the, the strange uh, circle thing with a lot of dark lines and every line is a, a call. And so you see sometimes PHP applications have very complicated call graphs too. Um, yeah, but so, so much for the visualization. 
The next thing I worked on was PHP decompilation. And I heard before that there are some non-free PHP decompilers, but I never knew um, how complicated it would be to decompile PHP code. And there was nothing public, and I didn't know anything about PHP uh, decompilation at all, or decompilation at all. So I was just searching the internet for papers and came up with this uh, reverse compilation thesis of Christiana Cifuentes, which is maybe the most, uh, maybe the well-known um, paper about decompilation. It's quite old, but uh, I just read it and realized that everything in there can be used for PHP bytecode, and you don't need much more than what is in this paper. So the implementation of a decompiler for PHP was very straightforward, and it mainly consists of graph structuring algorithms, and after you have structured the graph, uh, the code flow graphs of the functions, you can uh, create PHP code from there. Um, to show you how this looks, it's on the left, left side you have the, the code flow graph of some PHP function. Um, you see there are different colors for different parts of the, of the graph, and actually these uh, different parts of the graph are graph intervals. And the idea is to use graph intervals to, to find loops and to find uh, nested loops and um, the way you do this is you first find the intervals of the graph um, and then you collapse every interval to an own node. Um, in G G2 you see that every one of the four intervals of the first graph is collapsed into a single uh, node and the edges between uh, the intervals is n are now the edges between the nodes of the second graph. And you do the same again you end up with G3 and you do the same again and you end up with G4 and this is very good because it's a single, single node which means the graph is not irre irreducible. This means you can create a very good disassembly from it, a decompilation of it. If you have three or more, um, if you cannot reduce more than three because they uh, they um, reference each other, so you cannot reduce them anymore. Uh, then you have a problem, this usually is when, you, when your language supports Goto. Uh, once uh, the language supports Goto, um, uh, you cannot create a, a nice decompilation anymore because then you, you need to insert Goto statements and sometimes you cannot know if you need a Goto or if it's a normal while or loop or something else. Um, with PHP 5.3, there will also be Goto in PHP, but um, the thing is, uh, you will still not end up with uh, irreducible graphs because um, the thing that with Goto in PHP 5.3 is that you can only jump out of um, out of controlled structures. You cannot jump into controlled structures, and so you will not end up with re irreducible graphs. The next thing, um, okay, now. This means actually that you have detected two loops in, in, the, uh, in the PHP function that are nested. So um, after detecting the loops, you want to uh, detect all the, the if statements. And therefore, you uh, just look at every node that has, uh, has two um, follow nodes. And then you try to detect if it's an if then or if then else. And you do that by just um, checking if the, um, the f yeah, you do that by, by checking if the follow node of uh, one branch is actually this, uh, the other node that was branch in the other way. If, if it's, this is the case, then it's an if then, otherwise it's an if then else. And uh, when you do that, you ignore all the loop heads and, and tails, so, um, because they already belong to different uh, control structures, uh, structure, and um, you don't need them anymore. Um, yeah, the last thing is that you uh, detect compound conditionals, um, which uh, requires PHP jump change elimination. Otherwise, the algorithm doesn't work. It's not so Im interesting, actually. I'm running out of time, so I will try to speed up. 
Um, the thing with PHP bytecode decompilation is that it very uh, it benefits very uh, much from uh, the fact that uh, the send engine has very high level opcodes and there's a huge amount of send engine metadata that also needs to be present within the uh, encrypted bytecode so you can restore a lot of things and decompilation usually uh, completely recovers unobfuscated code and there are just uh, uh, small problems with protected members and classes so that you that you will end up with um, when you have um, a child class, you, um, you will sometimes end up with the same function in two uh, classes when actually the function was uh, inherited. But sometimes it's not possible to detect that it was inherited. Yeah, and obfuscated code is still easier to read than bytecode. And one place where I tried this was um, Kayako Live Response. This was one of the uh, shareware products I was talking about. And with Kayako, it's a case that you have um, only, two, two, only two files within Kayako are encrypted. And the customer said, well, audit it anyway. It's just two functions. There, won't be a, there will not be a security vulnerability in it. Actually, he was very wrong. Uh, there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability in it. And um, you see that, uh, which is marked red, it out outputs the query string and the... Um, and a post variable called query string directly to, to the template, and usually this needs to be encoded for HTML. And it's not done here, and so um, it's an XNS vulnerability. And the nice thing about this, it's within the encrypted file. So even if you know about it, you cannot protect yourself against it. Because um, yeah, you cannot change the source code. You need to contact Kayako, and if you are uh, lucky, they will not sue you because you know about it. And so, um, yeah, uh, because you normally don't, uh, you, you are not allowed to decompile the, the source code in some countries. And, and so, um, you cannot fix it, they can fix it maybe, and um, yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah, you said I can decompile the code and patch it. Yeah, like I said, but actually this is illegal uh, in many countries. You, you cannot just decompile the code. And uh, if, you, if you can decompile the code, you, of course, can, can patch it. But uh, this doesn't help uh, the millions of users that you are using it. And you cannot fix it and just uh, provide other users the, the fixed version. That's still, uh, this is even more illegal. Uh, <laughs> I didn't understand this question. Um, <laughs> well, you can try that, but um, the problem is uh, if you, um, the thing to, to get a binary patch, you would need to, uh, to just buy the send guard and um, encrypt it uh, again and then you need to, uh, to diff the files and uh, uh, too much trouble. Um, so maybe I can get to the, next, to the last topic which is bytecode, um, automatic bytecode analysis. The thing is manual uh, bytecode analysis is very time consuming and only if you are very crazy you want to read PHP bytecode and uh, normally you want to automate this stuff and um, Therefore, you can try simple pattern scanning, like normally many people that do source code audits start with, with a grep. Uh, you can do the same on bytecode, but it will give you f much more information. And you can also do static and dynamic data flow analysis. I will show you some examples about pattern scanning. Um, a question you usually have is how and where is user, user input handled in the application? It's a very uh, complicated question, but um, this actually means in PHP, where is there a read, write, or is that access to the super globals, which are get, post, cookie, request, file, server, and environment variables? Um, at bytecode level, you can answer this question very easily. You, can, you just search for three different kinds of bytecode, uh, bytecode opcodes, which are fetch R, fetch W, and fetch I. And uh, when you find them, you just check the operand and if it's uh, a constant string and it's one of the um, 
um, the super globals, um, you know that there was a read, write, or is it access on, on this thing. If you have source code, you can of course use grab for this, but uh, then you will. Um, you have two problems. First, you will get all the accesses that are commented out, and secondly, you only get the, uh, the information there is access, but you don't get the information that is read, write, or is set access. And most of the time, you only want to read access. Uh, sometimes you also want to write access because you want to know if they change the, the arrays and try to sanitize them in some way, and so you know exactly where in the application they sanitize uh, the input data. The next thing you can do with simple pattern scanning is uh, um, to answer the question, what include or evil statements are really 100% secure? Um, this is, of course, a, a question that will not help you in many ways. But uh, at bytecode level, this only means you search for the include or evil bytecode, opcode, and you just check if the operand is, is a constant. When you have an include or an evil on a constant, uh, value, it can't be influenced by user input, and so these uh, occurrence of includes or evils are always safe. Now you may maybe think this doesn't help you, but when you have a large PHP application and there are like 100,000 includes, then have fun grabbing through them and just uh, look for yourself if it's actually a constant or not. And by just checking this simple thing, you can eliminate a lot of false positives. Yeah, but actually, when you do when you do want to understand more complicated things, you need uh, data flow analysis, and I will just provide a very simple example of a backward data flow analysis that just searches for for hotspots, which are dangerous send engine opcodes or functions, and then it traces backwards through the operands or parameters and um, checks if this is actually safe or could be safe or it's uh, unsafe. For this, I have a very simple PHP function that um, consists of a simple if condition, and um, it one time it includes a constant string, and one time it includes a string that could be uh, influenced by user input, depending on the input on the, to the function. When you uh, compile this, you will end up with this uh, bytecode. Um, when you look at the bytecode, you already see that the opcodes are obviously very, very high level. So uh, actually, you can re recreate the source code from this uh, in your head, if you're crazy. Um, and um, so OK, let's start. I said we are searching for hotspots. So we search for the include or evil uh, comment, and we find, find it here. Uh, what we do is we check the operand. The operand is a constant string, so we know this is one is safe. We don't care. So the next thing is we search for the next hotspot, which is there. We have an include on the temporary variable six, and now we um, we need to scan backwards where uh, this variable was written to. Uh, because we have the code flow information, we know that there's only one uh, possible uh, place where. Um, where we can go. This is the line before. And we see there's a write access to temporary variable 6, and it uses uh, compiled variable 1 and concatenates a constant string. We know the constant string is safe, so we need to know if is the, the compiled variable 1 also safe. So we are now searching for write access to compiled variable 1. We go backward again. And we end up in a, an include statement that doesn't write to our variables, so we don't care. But now, due to the, the code flow information, we know there are two possible uh, previous lines. So we first go to the right, and we see there's a write access to our temporary no to our compiled variable one, and it writes um, a constant string in there. We know a constant string is safe, so we ignore it. We just cut the branch there and go to the other side. On the other side, we have a jump um, opcode. Uh, jump code doesn't write anywhere, so we don't care. The next thing is an assign. We see there's a temporary variable 2 that is assigned to uh, the compiled variable 1. So uh, now we need to find out what is actually uh, temporary variable 2. So again, we go, we go one line backward, and we see um, there's um, an array dimension 
on array, an array that is stored in temporary variable one, and the uh, key action, this is stored in temporary variable two. So now we know, we don't, we don't know what temporary, temporary variable one is, so we need to find out what this is. So we go backward again one line, and there we see that it's actually the get um, array. We know the get array is user input, we consider it unsafe, and so we know that there's one code path at least that results in an unsafe um, include. And um, we can terminate here and say this function is unsafe. It doesn't matter uh, what parameters the function uses, they're always unsafe. Of course, you can continue this, and uh, um, if there are more hotspots, but right now there's only one, no, there's no hotspot anymore, and you don't care. Of course, this is a very, very simple example. Um, it gets far more complicated when you have function calls because then you need to, um, to trace all the, uh, the parameters of the functions and not only the, the result operand that gets written to. And you also have the problem that uh, when you have a function parameters that are passed by reference, uh, that are also right, possible write accesses to your variables. So you also need to, to check if, um, um, if one of the parameters is actually um, the thing you are searching for. Gesundheit. Uh, um, yeah, and um, this all looks very, very complicated, but when I uh, experimented around with this, I was first, first um, implementing only a very small subset of the opcodes. Um, you can see all the opcodes below. Uh, these are very, very few ones, but um, they help you a lot to, to just eliminate a lot of false positives when you're searching for include uh, or require or evil statements that are unsafe. So these are just the opcodes that push variables to, uh, of uh, values to the stack, to the function stack. These are the opcodes that call functions. This is the include or evil uh, opcode. Of course, you need to know it when you want to, uh, to search include statements. Um, it's a concat operator, which uh, is used to concatenate strings. And last but not least, it's the fetch constant opcode. Um, usually, you see a lot of PHP scripts that use include constant concatenated with uh, something else. And to understand that, you need the fetch constant opcode. And um, actually, I tried this very simple thing uh, on one of the, um, yeah, PHP includes uh, vulnerabilities posted to Millworm, and this, uh, this example program had a very many uh, includes and requires, and normally you would have to, uh, to go through this manually, and I just tried my, my simple code that only understands these few uh, opcodes, and um, it was able to find exactly what was reported in this Millworm exploit. So it was two, two uh, cases where, uh, where get was directly used in, um, in, the, um, in an include statement, and so uh, I could uh, reproduce uh, exactly the, the thing reported to Millworm um, with this simple code. So if you are interested in this, you, next, next month you can download the byte kit and you can play around with this. Any questions? Uh, yes. Hello. Yeah, where? Well. Uh, there is an open source uh, compiler called Roadsend. Actually, it's a different implementation of PHP. Do you know that? And do you know if these methods uh, fit to this too? Um, I never looked at Roadsend because uh, I don't know anyone who's actually using it to protect its, uh, his PHP code. Most of the people are either using IronCube or SendGuardian. And in most cases, uh, they uh, actually have bought both products, and you can either download its IronCube encoded or uh, SendGuard encoded. But RoadSend is not so used so much. <laughs> 